Okay. Just give me a moment. Uh, my system here is uh, misbehaving a little bit. Okay. There we go. So, First Timothy chapter 6, beginning verse 3 to 10. And it's good that we actually have it. And today I want us to read together uh, loudly and in a coherent manner. Because there's something about just reading scripture together, which is... Uh, a great blessing to us. In the olden days, in the New Testament, remember Ezra, they would all go to a place and stand up and read the word together as the people of God. And I think it's something when we just are able to read together. So uh, the projection team, kindly just walk with us. We read from verse 3 to verse 10. And I want, one, once we get to the last line, begin to transition so that we don't have a, a very long lag time, all right? So which version is this? This is KJV, do you have the new King James version? The new, you don't? Okay, uh, okay, let's see how it happens. Just find a few old English words that we don't use. So can we read together, one, two, go. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evils are missing. Uh -huh. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Uh -huh. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have err, but and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You begin to see why I didn't want the King James Version, because the language, some things, we need to go back to the dictionary to find out what they mean. And the beauty with modern translations is they try and contextualize language and they take into consideration the evolution of language and also factoring in a enlightened understanding because as Bible scholars continue to study and reflect, some things become clearer. So you find that modern, uh, a number of modern uh, translations will put things a little more correctly, but that's not to say that there are also not some very wrong modern translations that we can try and avoid. And that's why it helps when a minister is also schooled in biblical studies. It helps to, of course, guard the congregation against unnecessary error in the area of translation and usage of words that may mislead uh, people in the spirit. Having said that then, um, we said last time that there are myths that abound when it comes to material prosperity because we know that in the recent years a lot of things have been said and written about the role of Christians in producing wealth on earth and managing it and using it and there's quite been a lot of enlightenment which we really appreciate and like I said last time uh, the church has come to a place whereby there is a measure of respect in terms of the people who come to church and people who love the Lord uh, because for a long time, Christianity was associated with weakness and, 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 and foolishness and poverty and want to an extent that I said that uh, there used to be a saying, it is still there but it's hardly used, that whenever people wanted to describe the level of poverty, they would say as poor as a church mouse. And I would guarantee that probably some of you for the last five years, maybe you have not had that statement because people have discovered that the church mouse no longer is poor, 
because things have changed. The, the church has understood that there is a place of, you know, real godly uh, prosperity. It is possible for Christians to be educated, to be sophisticated, yet love the Lord. It's possible for Christians to love the Lord and have lots of money, drive good cars, live in beautiful homes, in coveted estates, and all that. And so, really, that changes the whole outlook, and we, there has been all that. But then, again, you find that despite that, there has been a lot of misconceptions, because where truth abounds, then you also find error. And one of the things that the enemy want to do is to get us to the place where we, instead of sticking to the truth, we begin to shift towards error. And especially a teaching that is important, that like this one of prosperity, because we need to be prosperous. The gospel, uh, you know, especially in, the, in recent times, requires finances. There are places we need to travel, we need to fly, we need to drive, or we need to produce material, we need to communicate, we need to pay you know, TV programs so that they can air in areas where we can physically go. So things have changed and there is no way we can leave behind the place of material prosperity both for the church corporately and also believers individually. But because of the importance of the message, then you find it becomes easy for the enemy to try to counterfeit that which is precious. I've said here before that people rarely counterfeit useless things. If you find something that is useful, Something that is valuable, it will be counterfeited because you count. There is counterfeit gold, there is counterfeit diamond, there is counterfeit hundred dollar bills, there is counterfeit one thousand shillings. But it's very rare to find a counterfeit. I'm not really rare, but I am not hard of anyone counterfeiting five shillings because. Of counterfeiting that you would really benefit whenever we talk about something just then counterfeits will be a and we say that because of the counter prosperity we require adjustment so that we can be able to achieve biblical balance and the integrity that we need so that we can experience transformation in our families, in our communities, in the church, as well as in the nations that God is calling us to. And we looked at a number of misconceptions last time because of time limitation. And the first one we saw was that prosperity is automatic for Christians. That is a myth. You know, it's not automatic that just because somebody is a Christian, they will be prosperous. And there is enough evidence to show that. We are very many poor Christians poor in the sense that they don't have the material they will need. They cannot afford the life they want to live. They cannot afford to live where they want to live. They cannot afford to wear what they want to wear or even just do basic stuff and really just be comfortable, you know, humanly speaking. And so that means then there are certain things that we should be able to do. And that's why you find that the Bible gives us what we call divine principles of well creation that are enshrined in the word of God. They need to be activated. Just the way we know that the principle of salvation is that we believe that Jesus came in the flesh. He was tortured. He died. He, you know, he, 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 he was buried. He rose again. And so we believe that he is, he, is, he, is, he, is, he, is, he is risen. And we also confess with our mouth that he is the Lord. Then we get saved. It doesn't matter how much truth there is. If people don't activate it in a way, it will not help them. And so... Uh, when it comes to wealth creation, there are certain things that we need. We need to work hard. We need to sow, understand the, the principle of sowing and reaping. And yes, sowing and reaping, not just sowing money and material. Even sowing faithfulness, sowing diligence, sowing um, honesty, sowing into people's lives and just connecting and building bridges. All these are ways of sowing. And people who learn how to do that, you can begin to see they are translating their efforts into some material stuff in their lives. And so that's important for you to know. There is also the place of application of wisdom. You can work hard, you can sow and reap, but then if you don't apply wisdom, you could just bring everything to a stop. You do everything right, but a simple principle of wisdom, you just destroy everything you've been building or even sowing and working hard to build. And then we also talked about integrity. God is not just 
concerned about the end that we see or the end that we get to. God is concerned about the means through which we get to that end. You know, God is not the type of person that says that, you know, the end justifies the mean. For him, I mean the means. The means really must justify the end. How did you get this? How did you get there? God is a God of process. That's why throughout scripture, especially in the wisdom books, particularly Psalm and maybe Proverbs and partly Ecclesiastes, you find a lot of wisdom regarding how we should deal with one another. If you're in business, how do you treat people? What kind of measures and scales do you use? God is interested in that. So you find that those are principles that when we practice, then we can change this aspect that whereby Although it's not automatic that as Christians we are going to be prosperous materially, but if we do some of these things, it is possible actually to acquire material prosperity and wealth. Those are divine principles. The second uh, myth that we saw as far as um, material prosperity is concerned is that God claims only 10% of our finances. There are people who believe that just because you've given God 10%, then you, you can do whatever you want with the rest. And we're saying here that is a misconception. It's a myth. God is interested in 100% of everything he has given us. And that's why we said last time that if Christ is not the Lord of your possessions, that he can never simply be your Lord because everything you possess and yourself really belong to him. And we find that throughout scripture, there's a lot that abounds as far as how we should manage what God has given us. If he wasn't interested in 90% of what is left, then he would never bother to tell us what to do with it. Yet, you look at scripture, you find that there's a lot that the Bible talks about of what we need to do with the 90% that is remaining after we have given God the 10%. And just uh, to mention a few, we say that God teaches us how to get out of burdensome debt in scripture. Otherwise, then, if it wasn't important to him, he would never bother to do with that. Then he also wants us to invest wisely. Whatever we have, God wants that we invest it wisely because he is interested in what we do with it because he knows that if we do well, it will be for our own good and ultimately, of course, when we are doing well, God is glorified and our lives you know, paint a picture of people really that are doing well. And there is nothing wrong with us looking good, especially being Christians. There is something about... Christians looking good and organized that just brings some um, integrity and some honor to the message. You know, people sometimes look at believers. We are shoddy. We do things funny. We are dressed in crazy ways. And people, okay, they love our Lord, but the way he has made us look like, make him, you know, they, they start getting scared of him because of the way we look like. And so it's important to understand that God is interested in the outcome of what we do with what is given us. He's also taught us in his word how to be shrewd. And we say this word shrewd is a bit too, uh, too strong for, for meek and mild Christians. So we use the word smart or astute, you know, in our business dealings. We need to be able to know how to deal with our business uh, properly so that we can do what God wants us to do. We also saw that God is interested in what we do with our 90% that is left after we're given to him because he wants us to save our future generations. Why? Because the Bible says that a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And I told you last time that our God is a God of generations. He's a God of up to the third, even fourth generation that is not just interested in you. He wants what you do today to affect your children and their children's children. That's how God thinks. And so if he wasn't interested in the 90% of what you have, he would never bother to give us that wisdom in scripture. He found it wise to inspire and anoint the apostles and the people who wrote scripture to include that wisdom because it's good for instruction and for our use as we move on in life. God also records and the need to create business plans. It may not be direct, but the wisdom and the principle that you find in the words of Jesus about if you want to build or you want to get into a project, would you sit down and plan and ensure that you know where the funds are coming from, phase one, phase two, phase three, and how you're going to progress that. That is wisdom. It means then that God is saying, yes, you may you may have given me 10%, but I'm interested to know how you're going to manage the rest that I've also given you as much as you have already paid your obligation uh, as far as tithing. And many, many others, avoiding consigning, you know, for strangers, being surety 
for a stranger. That's an instruction that God is telling you, okay, you may have the 90%, but don't commit yourself to people you don't know because it will affect whatever is left of you. And of course, dealing honestly with other people. You know, do you lie? Do you cheat when you are given an opportunity to measure something for someone because you're selling it? Do you under, under, underweight? Do you overweight? You know, what do you really do? There is an element of honesty which is important because there's something to do with dealing with what God has given to us and what's left with us after we have given our tithe. The third myth, the third myth of, um, of financial prosperity or material prosperity that is really entertained is that all Christians are called to be very wealthy. All Christians are going to be very wealthy. I told you last time that I went to a meeting one time and the preachers say that if you, are, if you are poor, of course, poor again is relative. Because again, when you tell people you're poor, poor according to who? Because there are some of us who are poor in some quarters, but in other quarters, we are really the magnets. You understand that? That when you drive that little car of yours in the village, everybody stands on the road to look at it. But when you come to Nairobi, you are wondering where to drive it through. Because things have changed, isn't it? So what is, what, what is rich really is, is, is a relative. And so it's very, very, very important that we really understand the context of the words that we use. But what I'm saying is that it's a myth to think that all Christians are called to be very wealthy. It's really a myth. And you've heard people say, if you are a son of God, you can't be poor. And the question is, what do you mean by poor? What really do you mean? So we need to understand these things so that we avoid putting pressure on people that God never intended of them. Maybe it will help if I continue. <laughs> now, let me say this, that although God has allowed the body of Christ to leverage great wealth, he has. That's why we can be sitting in a property here today worth about half a billion. If that's not wealth, I don't know what it is. It really is. So God has allowed and has seated here. If we put our wealth together, actually, as a congregation, I think we control several billions here, seated here. If all of you just agree to declare your wealth so that I see really whether you are tithing properly. <laughs> if you agree... To declare your, your wealth, the, the plots you own, the, the money in the bank, the savings, all those things. Eh? If we all put that together and totaled it, just this small congregation here, you'd be surprised how much wealth we control. So God has allowed us to do that. However, let me finish my sentence. Not all individual Christians or even pastors can handle large amounts of money. Not all of us can do that. God will only give a people wealth that which they are able to properly manage and administrate. If you and I agree, and I believe we do, because we believe God is the owner of everything and we are stewards, God will be a very unwise steward or unwise owner, investor, if he would just carelessly allow anyone to administrate his resources. Just a simple example. If you had wealth you want administered, would you just go to the street and say, okay, just put a signboard. Anyone interested in managing my wealth, please come and I'll give it to you. You will never do that. What do you do? You first of all call people and interview them. You want to know what track record do you have of managing things? How much money have you handled before? Even those of you that are employed, you are sitting in an office and you're being told by the people employing you, this office commands 50 million every month. Have you ever handled this kind of a budget before? And if you have not, the interview panel will consider really not giving you a lot of points there because they know if they make a mistake of committing you to that and you don't have the experience, the capacity, you will run the company into business, I mean into problems. So if we as human beings know that, how much more God, 
who owns everything and commits to us. So he will be careful to ensure that before he releases anything to you, he knows what you're going to do with it. Now you ask me, but Bishop, there are so many fellows who have a lot of money and they really are not using it well. God didn't give it to them. Follow through. They stole it. They cheated. They bribed. But the proper process of God prospering you from one degree to another is usually a process. It's rare to find a boy of 15 years beginning to handle millions. Why? Because they are not qualified. Every young man as he grows, they think they'll be a millionaire by the time they are 30 years. They get to 30, they realize this is a different ball game together. You get to 45, you realize you're still dealing with a few thousands. And then you begin to manage your expectations. And then when you least expect it, God begins to release resources to you. And you wonder why. It's because God has finally brought you to a place whereby even if now he gives you stuff, you will manage properly. I know I'm not preaching very popular stuff here. Because everyone wants to handle stuff and money and millions. But wait, I continue, you'll understand why this is very tricky. That's why the few people that God gives resources should be able to release them for others. Because you, you can manage. So you only release to us because us, we can. You give to us what we need every day. That's why when we need your tithes, you must keep bringing them here. And the judge said, yes. Don't bring all the billions here at once. <laughs> I might change my location. God will only give a people that which they are able to properly manage and administrate. The way we deal with our children. I remember when children are young, you don't give them a lot of money. You start giving them little money, go and give the offering. You find sometimes they didn't give. You ask, what did you do? I bought some sweets. Oh, you know, okay, I need to still teach some lessons here. Then you keep graduating them. Graduating them. Graduating them. And for every parent who understands, because I and Pastan, we have a privilege of raising at least a teen up to a point where by now he's becoming an adult. And you know, the process of just knowing, okay, we can trust this boy 20 shillings and then 100. And then when he went to the university, we say, okay, let's risk. Let's put 5,000 in his account. Let's see how he manages the whole month. It never lasted 15 days. He came and says, oh, mom, you know, I really didn't do things like, can you lend me? I'll pay you. With what? What you will be getting the following month? <laughs> you understand that? And slowly by slowly, the fellow picks up and he begins to manage. Okay, the last time he pushed up to 20th. And we say, okay, let's, let's add a little more. And now you see the guy went and sometimes he saved up to 15,000 in a whole year. Today, we don't have to worry about that. But of course, it's an amount of money I cannot give. Because if I do that, the next thing I'll find, he has bought a blue Subaru with a huge exhaust pipe at the back. And he has no money to fuel it. <laughs> so if as a father, as evil as I am, I know that. Our God knows much better than that. And that's why some of you fret and you get depressed and you, you don't realize that God loves you so much that he's actually training and teaching you. It's not yet over. You don't know where he's taking you. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 22, just listen to this. The context is different, but the principle is powerful. This is about when God leads the children of Israel to the land that he promised them. Listen to what he says. I'm reading from the message version. Maybe you can look it up in the King James Version. Not very different, but the message version tends to be a bit blunt and common pedestrian language. God, your God, will get rid of these nations. These are the Hittites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Eh? So God, your God, will get rid of these nations bit by bit. You won't be permitted to wipe them out all at once, lest the wild animals take over and overwhelm you. 
Now here is God. He has promised the nation that I'm going to give you this land that belongs to Jebusite, Hephites, Hittites, and all these tight heights. Eh? And he says, by the way, don't get excited. You are not going to take this land at once. You'll be taking it bit by bit. Why? Because if you do that, they will all run away and much of it you won't manage. If you apply that in the context we are talking about, what happens is that if God does not prosper you and help you to acquire stuff bit by bit, what happens? The things become so many that they become like wild animals to you. Say, Bishop, now, how can you talk about prospering in all things and you start limiting us? It's not me. I just want to help you have a proper perspective of prosperity. Huge amounts of money and wealth can destroy the life, listen to this, of unqualified people. Let me repeat that. Huge sums of money or prosperity can destroy... John, can you just reduce my microphone a little bit? My, my engine is warming up. Huge sums of money and prosperity can destroy the lives of unqualified people. What am I trying to say? My sentence and my statement is very clear. I am not saying that prosperity or wealth is destructive. It's only destructive to unqualified people. And there are many unqualified people that want it, but they cannot manage it. We are living in an era whereby people want windfalls. Betting companies are all over the place. Why? Because we want instant money. Let me try and give you some statistics from the United States. According to multiple studies, and I looked at this in, in some website uh, called bradogale.com, about 70% of all lottery winners end up going broke and filing for bankruptcy. 70%. You don't have that up there. Oh, you have. <laughs> 70% of all lottery winners. Why? Because lottery does not give you money by degrees. It gives you an unexpected windfall, which is not God's design. And the church said, yes. Rarely does God give people windfalls. Because our God is a God of process. Even when Isaac sowed in the land. The Bible says he began to prosper. Beginning has a point. Then he continued. That's a process. Until he was prosperous. That's a process. Even when you look at the progression of someone like Joseph. Joseph, first of all, became responsible, and that's why the dad sent him to take food to the brothers. If the father didn't trust the responsibility of Joseph, then he would have thought that Joseph is like these boys where you send them, and he goes, he first puts the food down, and starts playing football on the road, and before he knows, the dogs have eaten the food. And then he has to go back saying, Daddy, you know, I don't know what happened. The dad knew that the boy is capable of taking the food to the brothers. When he got there arrested, he wasn't just taken to the king's palace immediately. He was taken to Potiphar's house by divine design. Because God was progressing the young man. And then from there, bigger responsibilities. The keeper of other prisoners. You are a prisoner, but then you are in charge of other prisoners. That is promotion, although in a funny place. But promotion nevertheless. Then from there, he is removed and taken to the king's palace. So we need to appreciate, friends, that there is something about divine process when it comes to the prosperity of God's people. And that's why whenever people wake up overnight and find that they have stuff, something just changes. You'll understand what happens to our children. We work so hard, we leave them lots of money. They wake up one day, we are dead. 
all this money is here now. What happens? Their head just go nuts. Because he woke up one day and there was no pro- they never worked for it. So that's why you read that about 70% of all lottery winners, these are going into the United States. It may be worse here. <laughs> winners end up going broke and filing for bankruptcy. Another point, about 1% of lottery winners who go bankrupt every single year. Of course, that's, a, that's, that's, that's is it 1%? Yes, of course, that's a lower percentage. But imagine every year. And you know in America, there's a lot of lottery. It's not like here. Here it just started. It's been there for years. Listen to this. Only 55% of them felt like they were happier after winning the lottery than before. A man called John Whitaker. He won 315 million in lottery in a lottery in West Virginia in the year 2002. What is 315 million dollars in Kenya shillings? Hmm? Times 100 chows, it is 315 what? Billion. 315 billion. Kenya shillings. 2002, not long ago. Eh? Listen to what happened to this man. <laughs> of course, you tell me, Bishop, me, I'm not Whitaker. No problem. <laughs> this is what he says. I wish that we had torn that ticket up. Hmm? That's what he said later. Why? Because after winning, Whitaker's daughter and granddaughter died due to drug overdoses. Reflecting on himself, he said, I just don't like Jack Whitaker himself now. I don't like the hard heart I have got. I don't like what I have become. That's a man who 2002 won a whooping equivalent of Kenya shillings over 300 billion. That's money enough to run a country for a few months, I think. Depends on the country. Some countries, this can run for five years. Kenya is only that our wage bill is too big. Otherwise, this would be good money. According to a man called Don McNay, a financial consultant to lottery winners. Guys are very smart. You become a financial consultant to lottery winners. You don't consult for anybody else. That's a good job, isn't it? Wow. Because you know money is always there. And your business. He's the author of life's lessons from the lottery. He says, Whitaker became crazy because he won the lottery. Otherwise, Whitaker would have been a fine man if he didn't have the lottery. I'm just giving you one example. We don't know how many others are recorded. Of course, they are wonderful success stories. But I'm just trying to say, if you manage to get hold of this kind of wealth and you are unqualified because Whitaker was unqualified. Don't get lost. That's what I'm talking about. You can dismiss Whitaker and me if you are qualified. I have no problem with you. But my question to you is, are you qualified for what you're asking for? According to McNay, many winners struggle with suicide, depression, and a divorce. And the simple reason for me from a scriptural point of view is they are simply not qualified. They are taking upon themselves responsibility that God has not prepared them for. I can almost hear a pin drop. Each person is given the number of talents according to their God-given ability and assignment. Many times we take upon ourselves resources for which God has not given us assignment. 
And that's why we don't know what to do with it. There are people seated here who want a lot of money. But let me tell you, if today you woke up and you have that money, you would be surprised. You would start asking, what do I do with this? And you would say, ah, Bishop, Missy, where is he? You will. Look at how people are doing things. You find somebody has 10 million in the house. Do you know it's very difficult to keep 10 million in a house? <laughs> so it means if you have to keep it in the house, you are not prepared for it. Because if you find someone keeping 10 million in the house, there's a problem. Because that kind of money is not supposed to be at home. So either somebody has stolen it and you can't take it to the bank because the first thing the bank manager asks you is, how did you get this money? Why? Because there's money laundering. There is Al-Qaeda. There is uh, Al-Shabaab. All these kind of things. And we must manage this. There's drug, drug trafficking. So if your money is and you're not afraid, let it go to the bank. You can explain about it. But you can't put it there. Why? Because the way you're getting that money, even you yourself, you cannot explain to anyone. I'm not trying to scare you friends from money. I just want, I believe I'm training people here to be billionaires. I believe this message is supposed to bring you to a place whereby you begin to realize that you must cooperate with God to build your character, your emotions, and your social networks to a point whereby even when God prospers too. You're going to handle it and we'll still have a brother and a sister that we need to serve in the church. Let me tell you, it's just that you don't know, but billionaires and millionaires would pay me to hear what I'm talking about because they need it. It's just that maybe we don't need this message here. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 15, this is an example of how, you know, Jesus was giving an example. But this is how the kingdom looks like. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. That's the kingdom that God has given us. And to one he gave five talents. And to another two, and to, a, to, to another one, to another one. And to each according to his own ability. We have been called into the kingdom and there's an expectation. And when it comes to talents, not just money. It's anything that God gives you. And that's why you find when people begin to discover what God called them to do and they do it according to the grace given to them, there is success and there is this there is, there is result. Because that's how God intends to work. That you don't look at some things I'm doing and you think you can do them. Verse 16, this is where the difference comes. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. If you read later, when the boss comes, he gives him the five talents. In other words, you have, been, you have proven yourself. You are qualified. You have passed the exam. Promotion. So if the story continued, if the boss was to go away again, I guarantee you this man probably would have now been given probably 10 or 20 talents. Because it's been promotion. There's been responsibility. There's been proven uh, qualification to manage the resources. Then, the other one who was given two, he gained two more also. And the same thing happened. He was given the two. In other words, from handling two, he's now handling four. Qualification. Now listen to the fellow who was given just one. Imagine just one talent. And instead went and played with it. Because here he didn't do what was supposed to be done. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground. And hid his Lord's money. Hiding. Why? Because the money and the kingdom resources don't belong to us. When God gives you stuff, friend, 
They are not yours. That's why it's very dangerous when God begins to put stuff in your hands and you think it's just meant for you. It's not. And that's why people get destroyed. If you look at people that have been destroyed by prosperity, they are not destroyed because there is anything wrong. It's just that they decided this is mine and it's mine alone. But if they knew and began to do something with it, according to the will and the purposes of God, their life would be very different. That's why you find smart billionaires at some point in their life, they begin to dish away their wealth. <laughs> because they realize this is too much for myself alone. Why should you wait until you're old to discover that? Just you realize I have all this much money. Even your doctor tells you you can now cannot fly because your capillaries cannot manage pressurization in the plane. So you have to stay home. You can't eat salt. Yeah? Your blood is too thin. What happened? I don't know. So, don't, don't drive fast cars. In fact, if you can drive a tractor, you'll be better off. <laughs> what is that telling you? This is not just meant for you. And that's why people get destroyed when they begin to gather things around themselves. If our church just begins to adjust mass things here and we begin to develop and polish every, everything, it will destroy us. Whatever God gives us, we must ask us, how can we touch the community outside here? That will help us. But if we start polishing things and painting, we start fighting over the colors, over the curtains, over the roof, and we start kicking each other very hard, for things that God never called us for. Why? Because we are focusing our resources where we're not supposed to. Not everyone in our church is called to be a multi-millionaire. Not everyone. But the people who are called, you must know yourself and you must begin to allow God to prepare you. I don't know who they are. I wish I was one of them. And I'm open to reality. But if it doesn't happen, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm fine. I will manage what God has given. If it's one talent, I'm going to trade until I bring two or even two and a half if possible. Handling material prosperity requires increasing levels, listen to these friends, of spiritual, social, financial, an emotional qualifications and maturity. I'll repeat that's a powerful statement. That handling material prosperity requires increasing levels of spiritual, social, financial, emotional qualifications and maturity. We need to be spiritually qualified to handle resources. That when God blesses you, brother, you will not begin to think you have become a small God. That just because God has put stuff in your hand, you can drive a good car, you can live in a big place, you can, you, you know, you can be, you can eat whatever you want, you can go where you go. You, you don't begin to think that you need a, a different church that caters for the people of your kind. You almost begin to think Jesus should introduce another special, rarefied and premium blood for your sins. It doesn't happen that way. I appreciate we are from different social status and there are situations, friends, where our social class will not simply allow us to fit in a place. For example, you cannot go to a church where people are just preaching in vernacular and you can't speak it. That's reality. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the condition of your heart. How do you feel when you meet someone who is not your class and they tell you I'm born? Do you despise them? Do you think they are less than you? Or do you consider them... That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Just attitude of heart. Because the way we do things is sort of the attitude in that. And that will come because you are spiritually qualified. You will not begin to think just because you are wealthy. All of a sudden, then people should do what you want. That the pastor should just do the project you want him to do because you are the one who finances the church ministry. No. It doesn't happen that way. When you begin to go that way, what's happening is you become spiritually unqualified because you don't understand order, you don't understand authority. 
I wish I could hear amens here today. At least I would know I'm saying good stuff. <laughs> what? <laughs> Financial maturity. Some people don't have even financial knowledge. God gives you money, you don't know how to manage it. You don't know how to invest, you don't know how to save it, you don't know how to deal with taxation issues. So what was meant to come to God is taken away by government because you are foolish in your way of filing returns. So if you believe God has called you to be someone who is going to handle finances, can you enroll in some class for non-finance managers? It will help you. You learn how to calculate costs and how to how to how to invest, how to how to how to um, how to you know work out what you call the future value of money, the present value of money. But some of us want money, but we don't even have the least. You know, you somebody can even the bank can even steal your money electronic. You will never know. People are withdrawing your money and you say, where did I spend this anyway? These days I'm having very many commitments. I should sour too. What? And then when you come to calculate your tithes, it's less money because money has been stolen and God is just watching you saying, is that what I gave you to do? My servant is struggling to paint the church and you have thrown away my money? You give an account. It's not a threat. Is the truth. Social qualification. Some of us are socially unqualified because the moment you get prospered, all of a sudden you start thinking, I need a second wife. <laughs> Just because now you have money. Or you begin to just ignore everybody. People who are your friends, people who helped you, people that worked with you when you had nothing, you just forget them. Some people even lend you money to eat when you had nothing. All of a sudden, they are nobody to you. The pastor who has worked with you when you didn't even tithe and he never asked you, you have forgotten him. You know, I have to put myself in that list so that I won. <laughs> so that you think, you don't think who left behind on this list. Praise the name of Jesus. Emotional qualification. We need to be qualified. How do you feel when you have money? Can people tell when you are or when it's this? Then it means that the bank determines your blood pressure. When the account is good, your pressure is normal. When it begins to go down, the, the pressure goes up. It's an inverse proportion situation. Those of you that have underst understand basic mathematics, inverse proportion. When one thing increases, the other one decreases. Our emotional and spiritual temperatures must never be determined by external things. They must be determined by our hope in the Lord. That our hope comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord. Okay. Hope I can see you manage. Can I stop there? You guys look like he, this is too much today. Pastor Abel, I stop there. <laughs> let me deal with <laughs> let me deal with the fourth myth. Have you understood by the way? I hope this is helpful. I don't know. If it's not, just keep waiting. You'll see what I'm saying very soon. If you haven't gotten there. But there are those of you that can resonate with what I'm saying. The fourth myth is that prosperity is a right of all those in Christ. It's a right. Now, let me begin by saying that the body of Christ has embraced 
a rights-centered gospel as opposed to a stewardship-centered gospel. There's nothing wrong with rights. The only problem is the gospel is never intended to be rights-centered. That is a spirit that is sweeping the world and it is going to destroy the world unless society changes everywhere. Rights. Rights. People no longer talk about stewardship and responsibility. Why is it that people are not talking of responsibility in equal measure as they talk about rights? Oh, human rights. Why don't we have a movement called the human responsibility? In fact, I think somebody needs right now to set up an organization called Human Responsibilities. We have the Kenya Human Rights. We need another one called the Kenya Human Responsibilities. As much as you have rights, you also have responsibilities. And so that's why we need to understand, friends, that it's not just about rights. My children have a right to what I have as a father. But we don't operate on that. We operate on responsibility. That's what we talk about because right is not an issue. We don't need to spend the whole day having a meeting around our dining table and Mumo is asking me, so dad, what is my right here? That can never be a discussion. But I need us to talk about, okay, young man, what are your responsibilities? The dishes are rotting in the sink. The trash can is not sent out. Your brother's bed is in a mess. Because it's stewardship. So it's not about rights, friends. We need to shift our minds from a right-centered gospel to a steward-centered gospel. That's what you find now when young people get exposed to the gospel, they talk about their right. I'm a child of the king. That should never be in discussion. Have you ever found John walking around and telling everybody I am the big man's son? You don't need to do that. Or have you found a full grown man who has been alive for 40 years and he goes saying, I'm a man, can't you see? If you have to tell people who you are, you probably are not. Can I say that again? If you have to tell people who you are, you probably are not. Those of you that work, if you ever catch yourself standing in front of your employees telling them, you guys, you must understand who I am in this company. Just know you have lost it. You don't need to say that. Not necessarily because you have a JD, but just a fact, virtue of the fact that you do what you're supposed to do and you know what you're supposed to do. The Apostle Paul had the right attitude for a Christian and a servant of God. Because part of this problem is not so much with the church because what has happened is it is when the gospel ministers go to a place whereby they began to embrace a rights-based gospel, then they, you know, send the same spirit to the members so that now members have a right, not stewardship. And you can see that even in today's church. People are not available to serve. People, today I, walk, I, I came to this compound, I couldn't believe. Littered, literally. And I'm sure there were young people here yesterday in the wedding. But they walked away leaving the place. Why? Because no stewardship. Somebody didn't ask. Tomorrow there's a Sunday service here. What happens when we get here? And that's the spirit that we are fanning in the church. People are being driven by their right. It's my right. I can assure you today there are people who are funded because there's no lunch today. It's my right. Do you know where the lunch came from? <laughs> How many churches give people lunch? In fact, I even wonder why we do that. You know, when you hear a bishop talking like that, uh, something is in the, in, in the horizon. Can I tell you? Whenever we are going to have lunch here, the church is full. There is not a single seat that is empty. And that we know. I, I can prove you with statistics. And then for another three Sunday, the church is dry of members. 
That's exactly what I'm talking about. Rights. The Apostle Paul talking about ministry. He says, if you want, you can read the entire context. It's, it's long. I wouldn't go into that. But he gets to a point whereby he's saying, if we have sown spiritual things to you, for you, is it a great thing we reap your material things? In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, by the way, it's my right. It's our right as ministers because you've been sowing spiritual stuff to you. So it's not, there's nothing big. You are not doing me a favor when you put an envelope full of some wonderful notes and give it to me and you apologize for delaying it. You don't like that. According to the Apostle Paul, he's simply saying, it's not a great thing. You're not doing us a favor. Because there is no one who goes to war and uses his own artillery and weapon to do that. Read the earlier context. That's what he's saying. But it looks like the Apostle Paul himself, because he embraced a stewardship-based gospel, he's saying, I'm working in my own hands. Yet he has a right. That's what he's telling them. I have a right to your resources. I have a right to your material things. I have a right to a car. I have a right to a suit. I have a right to money. I have a right to lunch this afternoon because I'm sowing spiritual stuff to you. What are you sowing to me? If we have sown spiritual things, for you. Is it a great thing? In other words, he's asking a rhetorical question. He's not looking for an answer. But what he's saying, it is not a great thing if we reap material things from you. That's why after every service, I should be standing at the door there with a personal assistant on the side. Unanisalimia, <laughs> unamuona. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? If the dentist you go to see has a right over what he does to you, if your lawyer has a right over what he does to you, don't I have more right that I'm even dealing with you, not just earthly, but eternally? When you are Dentist repairs your teeth. It stops here. After you die, me, what I'm doing for you will last forever. <laughs> Same bishop, there's something that happens to you when Pastor Anne travels. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But I'm just preaching. If I read something that is not scripture, just ignore it. Just know the man is crazy today. Are we not even more? In other words, he's saying, we qualify, we have a right. But listen to his words. Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. He brings it to perspective. He says, we have a right. So in other words, he's saying, it's not a question of rights. So what I'm trying to tell you, friends, is we may have rights, but we should never spend our energies focusing on the rights that we have. But we should ask ourselves, what is our responsibility as stewards of what God has given to us? That's why you should not go thumping yourself and saying, it's my right to be a millionaire. It's your responsibility to be a millionaire. Because you need to manage that as a steward. Not as your things. A stewardship-centered gospel will enable us to view our gifts our calling, our resources is a responsibility to serve and bless others. Not something handed to us because we have the right to be a Christian. If you start seeing the things God has given you, as you know, God has no choice, I'm his child. Then you are getting it very wrong. You must understand it's simply stewardship. And that's how you need to look at it. And that's why I still want to encourage church members here. If your God has blessed you in a particular field, whether technology, you know, IT, building, engineering, whatever, see how you can use those resources to serve this church. And don't come with an idea of I need to be paid because that's the other problem we are having. 
Anyone who comes to this church to serve, I must be paid. This church has too much money. Who told you? It doesn't. Otherwise, you will not be walking from the tarmac onto mud here. The mother's room remains with the canvas. Some of you wonder, why can't Bishop repair that? I wish I could give you the payroll to pay the staff for just two months. You would understand why my hair is white. <laughs> Barely at 50. You know, I have to speak to you as a father, isn't it? And that's the problem of being pastored by one man for 20 years. He becomes too bold. Charles, I need to transition. Some people cannot manage this. <laughs> it's too much. But I have to tell you the truth. So the apostle Paul is saying, I am not driven by rights. So in the same way, our becoming millionaires is not really a right. It should be viewed as a stewardship. Because the moment it becomes your right, then you lose sense of why God makes you a millionaire. Because the reason he makes you a millionaire is so that you can serve humanity not as a matter of your right. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, verse 17 to 19, I want us to, I think we, we read that earlier together, but let me just read it. And this is the Apostle Paul. And this is why I believe the ch church ministers need to come to a place whereby they have spiritual authority to speak and write like the Apostle Paul. He says, command those who are rich in this present age. Not request them. I should be calling fellows who I know have money and I tell them, listen, this is what I'm telling you to do. I command you. <laughs> hey, I like this. <laughs> Isn't it nice to command rich people? And you know what you're telling them to do? Not to be haughty. Not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Verse 18, let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold. Command them. But what I... Oh, you know, it's a privilege that you are here. I'm dead. When rich people come, the pastor is jelly. When they leave, he has a depression for four months. See, I'm going on sabbatical, not because you're going to rest. You're depressed because one day a tight check just goes. Whoosh. But the apostle Paul, who had embraced a steward centered gospel, not rights. He writes to the young apostle Timothy and tells him, command them. And he reminds him they are only rich in this present age. We are not sure about the coming one. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. The word of God is tough, isn't it? The primary purpose of wealth is a matter of stewardship to serve humanity, not a matter of right because we are Christians. That's what I just said. Friends, in conclusion, all Christians are not necessarily qualified to handle great material wealth. Not necessarily qualified. So there's a caveat so that we manage our expectations. And what we need to be asking the Lord is to help us to build our capacity and put ourselves at a place whereby we can learn. What are you doing to enhance your capacity to handle wealth? What are you doing? Some of us even learning simple disciplines like work, you can't. We say we need young people to clean the hall. Only two people come here on Sunday morning. That's part of training. That's how the qualification comes. God begins to break you as a young person. You know, exposes you to responsibility. 
Some of you, you are sent to buy something, you can't even bring a receipt back. And if you have to bring it, it is a receipt that the accountant cannot accept. Why? Because you went and forged it. Where will God trust you if you can't be trusted 200 shillings to buy a loaf of bread for the teens meeting? It's terrible. Sometimes God will expose you to handle other people's things. A lot of money, but you have nothing. I remember as a young pastor, my salary was only 9,000 shillings. A full university graduate, several years graduated. 9,000 shillings, I'm banking every month, I have a million. I can't touch a coin. Not because I couldn't. I'm the one who was counting and banking. Faithfully, put everything there. I only take that which belongs to me. And I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm not saying that I've reached there. Possibly, I'm still learning. That's why I'm still not probably handling a lot of millions, but I'm learning. We have to understand, friends, that there has to be effort by us to grow in terms of our social, emotional, spiritual, and social capacity, financial education, to be able to manage what God commits to us. The church is probably the self-limiting factor why God hasn't released a lot of resources to us. Because even just by the way we handle the things that God gives us, it's a shame. You walk into a compound like this and you can see these guys. If this compound belonged to another institution, you'd be surprised. But because it's a church, it's a church. the grass grows by grace. The grass is mowed by grace. The trees grow by grace. The trash will be swept by grace. That's why. But when real Christians wake up, Christians who are responsible, they don't need to be told. Some of you wait to be told what to do. Our bishop has not told me. I see them struggle with that thing there. Me, I'm trained up to. I know all the projectors. Even I can count them, the models by name. He has not called me. Pride. I'm not going to call you. We will struggle. And you will meet with God. You will, you will tell him why you came to this church. You tell him. If there is something you can do in this church and it's not being done, don't blame me. We have a very open policy here in this church. In fact, this is one of the very open churches where you can talk to me anywhere on the compound. Otherwise, I should be escorted by several bouncers and <laughs> with walkie-talkies, one ahead and three just slightly ahead and four behind and nine on the side. <laughs> we need to build capacity to handle prosperity, spiritual maturity, emotional stability, social capacity, financial education. And the gospel is not right-based, but stewardship-centered. Remember that. If there is nothing else I've said today that's powerful, I believe that is. We must begin to handle ourselves as if we are dealing with a gospel. That's not just a gospel of rights. The church has become so arrogant. There's a new breed of believers that are driven by arrogance in the name of sons of God. But irresponsible. Operating on a rights-based gospel, but not stewardship-centered. And finally, material prosperity is a privilege given to us by God to serve others first. Material prosperity is a privilege given to us by God to serve others first. So, as I invite the band up here in the worship team. If you come to a place where God begins to put prosperity and wealth in your hands, you need to begin to ask the Lord, what do you want me to do with this? What do you want me to do with this? You have to listen. The way every other talent is important. These young people here, they come here to play the music. They're serving God. You are not a musician. 
to bring a difference in the economic status and welfare of the church, both corporately and individually. Are there people in the church you need to empower? There are people seated here who are really good in business, but we cannot have money to give them capital. Why? Even the church cannot even create a welfare fund because even the money we have is not even enough to run the basic operations of the church. And it's not because we don't have, we do. I told you, if we were to sit here right now and every one of you genuinely declares your wealth in terms of how much comes monthly, just that, and then we calculate a 10% of that, you'll be surprised that only what is coming in is probably 20% you'll be surprised. And that's a church for you. That's why other religions beat, especially Eastern and Middle Eastern, they beat the church 10 nil in terms of resource mobilization for the work of God. There are certain religions, if I was to tell you, when it comes to them building the houses of worship for them, they don't leave anything to chance. Complex buildings, very expensive. Details. But churches, you go to Kakuzi, they are by some poles, even untreated. Weka tatu wapo, tatu wapo, nengine tatu. Weka mabati. Piga mutamba na panya. Mutamba na panya ni ile chuma inarana hapo mnaijua. What is it called? War plate. Pa, no, ile ya uko mwisho, uko kwa. War plate. He believes in God, international holiness church, even in that place. And God will come through. Because God is faithful. But must we get there? I challenge you in the name of Jesus. Be among the people that are willing to be prepared and to be equipped by God to handle resources, not just for yourself, but for the sake of the ministry for the sake of the ministry. I'm so glad these young people are listening to me. You are the generation that is going to take this message to the next level. Allow it to seep in your spirit. Because the future will not be as easy as the present. Challenges are going to come. People will increasingly become callous and selfish and self-focused. But we need a breed of Christians who are still remnant and they are willing to do what God wants them to do. I want us to stand for a moment and just honor God in his word. Sometimes it's difficult to know what really God is saying to you. But I believe this sermon is very personal. I want you to remember that you don't have to be a millionaire to serve the Lord that whatever level God brings you to, whether it is five talents, whether it is two talents, whether it's one talent, that is the level that he has called you. That's the grace he has given to you. There are people here that are going to operate on five talents. There are others that will operate on two. There are others that will operate on one. Wherever you are, what God expects is faithfulness and stewardship. It's not the amount. Sometimes you spend too much time worrying about the quantities of what God gives us. All you need to do is make use of what is given to you. I don't have to spend my days comparing myself with T.D. Jakes. I'm not T.D. Jakes. God has given him his grace to be T.D. Jakes. I will operate on my grace that is given me here until I can't do it anymore. And I faithfully do that to the glory of God. That's why whenever I stand here, I give it my best. I do whatever I can do. I say whatever I can say to bring that which I believe God once brought to his people. And that's what I want you to do at the place that you are. You may just be beginning. It may be difficult. You may be wondering even where will I ever get enough to put on the table. No problem. Most of us start there. But as we grow, as we faithfully demonstrate to God that we are capable, that we have educated ourselves, we have learned experience the levels of prosperity that he wants us to experience i want us just bow our hands everybody we just begin to worship him i want you to receive that word whichever way it may have been hard eating for you it may have been very difficult probably even abstract 
but whatever it is i sense that there is something very foundational that god is working in our hearts this afternoon there is something foundational that god is dealing with in our hearts as he prepares us to deal with the issues of being prospered and being committed to resources that he wants us to handle hallelujah father we thank you we receive your word this day by faith thank you for speaking to us in a way that is profound and just challenging our positions and our long held convictions and aspirations it's because lord you love us and you want to bring us to a place of responsibility a place of handling that which you committed to us as stewards lord i'm asking that you help me particularly to be able to deal with myself and the things that would come in between me and the responsibilities that you would want me to have lord i surrender to you lord i surrender my selfishness lord everything that hinders the progress of your prosperity upon my life that lord i will not be the hindrance or the obstacle that stops you from doing what you want to do and lord i pray for my brothers and sisters today that this word will change us this was to transform us you bring us to a place of total transformation in the name of jesus father we give you praise and we give you glory how we pray the race sincere and faithful people here millionaires and billionaires who are handling resources not just for themselves but for the kingdom of god lord i pray that you confirm this word that is true with signs and wonders following opening doors and bringing your people to a place of provision in the name of jesus lord even in that breath i know there are some who even trusting you for bread on the table is is an issue yes lord i know you bring us to that place and yet it's a place of being taught a place of being broken a place of being educated i pray that even in such times we will remember that indeed you are faithful and you are able father i give you praise i give you glory thank you that you are good god we worship you i pray for the greater church of jesus christ it bring us to a place of responsibility that we can understand the immense responsibility that we have to change the world for the glory of god lord i pray for brethren out there that are handling resources finances and issues that lord they will come to a place of understanding why you have placed them in that position i worship you i give you glory lord move upon us by the power of your spirit today move upon us lord by the power of your spirit in the name of jesus we worship you we worship you lord Hallelujah. Glory, glory. We praise you, Lord. Mm. We We will We praise we give you glory. Hallelujah. But in that message is the grace everybody said everybody said amen amen put your hands together amen bless you amen accessory party a avis which church are all welcome the lord may they prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prosper this was thank you for tuning in God bless you. The order of our services is as follows. 
From 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., we have the intercessory prayers. And from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., we have the main service, which runs concurrently with the teens and children's church. You are all welcome. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. The order of our services is as follows. From 9 to 9.30 a.m. we have the intercessory prayers. And from 9.30 a.m. We have the main service, which runs concurrently with the teens and children's church. You are all welcome. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. The order of our services is as follows. From 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., we have the intercessory prayers. And from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., we have the main service, which runs concurrently with the teens and children's church. You are all welcome. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. The order of our services is as follows. From 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., we have the intercession. Accessory prayers and from 9 30 a.m. to 11 30 a.m. we have the main service which runs concurrently with the teens and children's all I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers thank you for tuning in God bless you the order of our services is as follows from 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., we have the intercessory prayers. And from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., we have...